next disease entity which is our thyroid eye disease now thyroid eye disease is also known as thyroid associated orbitopathy or graves of thalmopathy so as we've already seen thyroid was the most common reason for both unilateral and bilateral proptosis seen in adults so this point i've already mentioned but it is an extremely important point and you have to make another note of it okay so it is the most common cause of both unilateral and bilateral proptosis seen in adults now when looking at the uh, thyroid status of patient presenting with thyroid eye disease in 90 percent of the patients there is presence of hyperthyroidism however few of the patients with hypo and euthyroidism can also have thyroid eye disease so it is around four percent of hypothyroid patients and 6% of youth thyroid patient that is normal thyroid levels can also have symptoms of thyroid eye disease. Now what are the risk factors of thyroid uh, of thalmopathy? So it is generally seen in middle aged females. So middle aged females is a risk factor for development of thyroid eye disease. Along with that smoking certainly aggravates the condition and can cause earlier development of your thyroid of thalmopathy. Apart from that patients who have an autoimmune nature of thyroid disease or who have had earlier treatment with radioactive iodine uh, for their hyperthyroidism can again run a higher risk of development of uh, thyroid eye disease so development of ocular symptoms due to thyroid apart from that also positivity for hladr3 and hlab8 is also linked with increased rate of uh, eye involvement in thyroid patients so what is the pathogenesis uh, that is involved in thyroid eye disease so normally what is happening is uh, basically there is an autoimmune response that's happening against your thyroid follicles a similar type of autoimmune response is happening against the orbital content that is your extraocular muscles and your orbital connective tissue because of which there is a recruitment of your t-cells uh, your other lymphocytes and neutrophils so there is an inflammatory response that is happening within your muscles and connective tissue because of which increased amount of glycosaminoglycans are getting deposited within these structures along with activation of fibroblasts. So during the active phases there is a lot of cellular infiltration of your inflammatory cells with deposition of glycosaminoglycans which is increasing uh, the osmolarity of these tissues and causing more amount of edema that is setting in within these orbital tissue and causing raised intraorbital pressure that is happening. Uh, in, in severe cases, this pressure can go and compress onto the nerve uh, leading to uh, optic neuropathy related to thyroid eye disease. However, it is just during these active inflammatory stages uh, that you run such a risk. Eventually, what is going to happen is that this inflammation is going to die down and uh, all these inflammatory cells are going to be replaced by fibrous tissue and this entire tissue is going to undergo fibrosis and the eye will eventually quieten out and will become white eye with few restrictive pathologies that I'll be talking about in subsequent slides. So this inflammatory or the acute uh, phase lasts for around uh, one to three years. So it is the acute inflammatory or your congestive stage, congestive stage that stays for around one to three years following which your in, uh, inflammation sets down and your fibrosis sets in. Uh, leading to various restrictive uh, pathologies happening in the eye. However, the eye tends to remain white. So during congestive phase, patient is going to be symptomatic in the form of tearing, photophobia, lacrimation. Uh, patient is going to have a red eye and a lot of irritation in the eye. However, in late stages, that is in the quiescent stage, the eye is going to be quiet. However, patient is going to have restrictive pathologies in the form of motility effect. However, the eye is going to be painless. The symptoms that you generally see is basically red eye, photophobia, lacrimation that I've already told you. Along with that, there can be puffy eyelids. Uh, there can be uh, various signs that can be elicited in thyroid eye disease and all these signs are really important for your exams. Okay, so the first is lid retraction, which is the most common sign. So the most common sign associated with thyroid eye disease is presence of lid retraction where your upper and lower lids are retracted due to overaction of your sympathetic stimulation which is going to act on your Muller's muscles and this will lead to a retraction of both your upper and lower lid and there will be scleral show. So lid retraction is the first and most common sign of your 
thyroid eye disease there can be hyperemia which is seen at the insertion of the horizontal recti both these points extremely uh, important other signs that can be elicited can be seen uh, in these pictures the first is your dalrymple dal sign where you see lid retraction in the primary gaze so both the eyes you see lid retraction uh, which is there in the primary phase this is known as dalrymple dal sign while cocher sign uh, shows that there is a lot of staring and frightened appearance in the eyes so you can see the eyes look like as if they staring out so this is your cocher co sign so dalrymple dal sign cocher sign and then then there can be lid lag so normally what happens whenever we are looking down so in the down gaze as the eyeball is moving down your lid is going to follow the eyeball and it will also go down however what happens in thyroid eye disease is that the lid fails to follow the eyeball and hence it is lagging behind so this lid lag is termed as von grafe's sign so you can see in this picture the eyeball has turned down but the lid has failed to follow the eyeball or is lagging behind the eyeball and this is known as von grafe's sign apart from that there can be fullness of your eyelids known as enroth sign because of the fullness there is difficulty in eversion of the eyelid which is known as gifford sign there is presence of infrequent blinking of the eyes which is known as steel wag sign so we have learned many signs here uh, and you just have to know these signs because any of these can be asked in your mcqs also all these images can be asked as image based question and can be asked about the association uh, with these particular signs then you know that it is your thyroid eye disease that is going to present with these signs so just to uh, remind you again we have dalrymple sign which is your lid retraction cocher sign which is your tearing response of the eye lid lag which is von grafe's sign uh, there is uh, enroth sign which is fullness of the uh, eyelid there is difficulty in eversion which is gifford sign and there is infrequent blinking which is steel wag sign another sign that is there is weakness of the convergence which is known as mobius sign so along with all these lid signs what can happen is there is presence of proptosis okay now this proptosis can be unilateral or it can be bilateral or uh, it can have an asymmetrical presentation that is one eye will get involved first and then eventually the other eye will get involved or it can be an asymmetrical pre uh, presentation where one eye is generally okay but the symptoms are seen only in the only the other eye okay the proptosis that is seen with thyroid eye disease is axial proptosis okay in case the proptosis is so severe that the eye has uh protruded out so much now the lid is unable to cover the eye properly and that can lead to exposure and that can affect your cornea and cause exposure keratopathy so this is extreme amount of proptosis can eventually lead to uh exposure keratopathy now coming on to restrictive myopathy so now acute phase has gone and uh all your uh, orbital content have now fibrosed so your muscles are going to get fibrosed so of the four recti that are there the first recti that can undergo fibrosis is your inferior rectus if your inferior rectus gets fibrosed now the eye is unable to move up and hence patient is going to have an elevation defect so elevation defect is the first muscle involvement that is seen in case of or first motility deficit seen in your thyroid eye disease that is due to involvement of your inferior rectus so after your inferior rectus then comes your medial rectus then comes your superior rectus and then comes your lateral rectus so lateral rectus will be involved last so it is inferior medial superior and lateral one interesting finding that you need to know is that whenever there is enlargement of your muscle uh, fiber in your thyroid eye disease it is only the belly of the muscle which gets involved while the tendon of the muscle is spared so this is very typical of thyroid so it is a tendon sparing belly enlargement of muscle that is there in thyroid eye disease again an important point so you can appreciate this uh, image it is only the belly that is getting uh enlarged however the tendon is spared so it is a tendon sparing enlargement of the muscle belly so this is just a clinical photograph showing an elevation defect a uh, deficit 
So you can see this eye is going up, but this eye is unable to go up. So uh, in this, there is uh, abduction deficit. So you can see the eye cannot is not moving up to the lateral canthus. This is a depression defect, while this is an adduction defect. That is, the eye is unable to move inside. Then comes your optic neuropathy. Now, optic neuropathy is basically a compressive type of optic neuropathy. Now, because of the severe form of inflammation and edema that is happening inside the eye, especially during your congestive phase, that the intraorbital pressure has become so high that it, it is going to compress onto the optic nerve behind and the optic nerve is now going to get involved. So, because of which the patient is going to have uh, defective vision. So, vision uh, loss will be there. Patient is going to present with RAPD. So, you can elicit an RAPD response in the eye and uh, uh, and basically it will be one of the important indication to decompress the eye since your optic nerve is getting involved. So, it is a compressive sort of optic neuropathy that you can see in your thyroid eye disease, especially during the acute phases. Now, coming on to the classification of thyroid eye disease, so it can be classified according to a no specs classification. So, it is basically a mnemonic based uh, classification which says no specs. So, uh, it indicates the severity of involvement of the disease. So, with no N stands for no signs and symptoms. So, patient is not going to have any signs and symptoms. Class 1 will be O, that is presence of only signs but no symptoms. S will be soft tissue involvement because of which now patient is going to have symptoms like uh, watering, photophobia, your swelling in the lid and conjunctiva. Then patient can develop proptosis. So your P stands for proptosis. Then your extraocular muscles can get involved which is, is indicated by letter E. C indicates your corneal involvement in the form of exposure keratopathy in cases of extreme amount of proptosis and the last will be your sight loss. So, last S stands for sight loss. That is going to happen only when your optic nerve gets involved in the form of compressive optic neuropathy. So, this is your no specs classification and is very important. So, what are the investigations that you have to run or what are the lab investigations that you need to run for these uh, kind of patients? So, obviously, you have to run a thyroid function test with your T3, T4 and TSH level. Apart from that, you have to also do thyroid autoantibody assay including all your anti-TSH receptor antibody, anti-thyroid thyroid peroxidase, TPO uh, antibodies and other uh, related antibodies. Along with that, you can do ultrasonography which will show enlargement of your muscle which can actually be measured and documented so that we can uh, see how the enlargement is progressing or decreasing over the time or during the course of the disease. Uh, CT and MRI usually are indicated especially in cases where we are suspecting uh, any sort of compressive optic neuropathy or in cases where we are going to plan any surgery uh, for these kind of patients, especially your orbital decompression surgery. In those cases, again, we need CT and MRI. Now, what is the treatment modality? So, the first will be to control your thyroid level. So, bring down your thyroid to a normal level. Second is to stop smoking. So, if in case patient is a chronic smoker, then we have to ask the patient to quit smoking. In the mild cases, the only treatment that you need is lubricants just to alleviate the symptoms of the patient during the acute phase. Also, you can give guanathidine because it helps to reduce the lid retraction that is present. So, in mild cases, it is just lubricants. In cases of moderate to severe cases of proptosis, what we can do, we can give oral steroids which can initially be started on, so patient can be given a small short duration course of intravenous steroids followed by oral steroids in tapering doses. However, in cases where we suspect an, uh, uh, any optic neuropathy or compression that is happening because of uh, the edema, we can also give in radiotherapy. However, uh, steroids uh, stand a better chance in uh, controlling the inflammation during the active phase. However, uh, in severe form or severe cases which are not responding well to your uh, steroid therapy or patient is landing up into optic neuropathy or there is extreme amount of exposure keratopathy, in those cases we can undertake these patients for orbital decompression. So basically we are going to decompress the orbital 
chamber so that we can make some space for these ocular content or vital content which has come out to go back into the orbit and uh, decrease the proptosis and also relieve uh, the compressive forces that are acting onto your optic nerve. So that would be your optic decompression. In case in the uh, quiet, in, when the disease has quietened out and now the eyes become white, but now the restriction has started set in and patient is now developing diplopia because of the restrictive uh, involvement of your muscles. In those cases, if the diplopia is very severe, we can undertake the patients for your extraocular muscle surgery. But one thing that needs to be noted is that since the muscles are already fibrosed, fibrotic, they don't have that strength of contraction and relaxation, we can never do a resection surgery in thyroid eye disease patients. It is always a recession surgery. Resection is cutting down of your muscle. Now your muscle is not strong enough to do anything much. So you never do a resection surgery. It is always a recession surgery that we do in order to alleviate the symptoms of diplopia if it is setting in due to the restrictive pathology of the uh, late stages of your thyroid eye disease. So that's all from thyroid eye disease and I'll catch you next with other orbital infections. Thank you.